Like, I don't see a path where crypto can exist in a fiat-run marketplace. Because ultimately, the U.S. government is just social security with an army. Nobody needs to be a billionaire. Like, there just shouldn't be any. So now I'm switching it away from, like, my problem with crypto to my problem with everything. My problem with everything is that there are too few people who have too much and too many who suffer too much. And I, if crypto was solving that problem, I would be the first in line. I just don't believe that the people who are involved in crypto actually believe that they should be solving that problem. I think the problem they're worried about is whether or not they have a yacht. These people are criminals who don't understand what they're doing, never understood the regulatory space they were in, never understood how to do it right, and never should have been given the keys to anything. Hey, Robert, how's it going? What's going on? Roberto Verde so, is not actually my name, so I just want to be super clear. <laughs> it's the it's the name of a shady man who does a uh, marketing for 100%. New York City. It's, it's yes, it is my shade name. Um, <laughs> I'm Robert Green. I'm a marketing uh, consultant and a content strategist and creator. I've been doing it for about thirty years in every format known to humankind. Um, we're talking for various reasons. One, because of uh, reaching out on LinkedIn, but Two, because I was involved in a um, crypto marketing sort of scheme for, I'd say, about five months in 2017, 2018, where I worked for several companies creating uh, like sort of explainer videos, launch videos, um, mostly around what was the currency of the time, which was ICOs wasn't exclusively that. We also, some of our explainer videos were just product videos, basically. Um, our specialty at the time was in like fintech uh, in particular, and a lot of stuff that was associated with New York City, Wall Street, kind of uh, tr trying to attract people from that world into the crypto world. So it was a particular ask. And because um, I had experience working with American Express, Bank of America, Jeffries, um, Alliance Bernstein, and a bunch of other huge money managers here in, in the city. Um, I think I was probably an attractive sort of bridge for people to speak and even day traders and like uh, day traders, the way you understood them in 2017, 2018, to be clear, like things have changed so rapidly that like now it's you as a, whatever you are, 14 year old, fine, 22 you can be a day trader perfectly well because all the tools are there for you to be able to do it. But there still was an expectation in New York that that meant you were a person who had a, you know, a, a series seven license and all of these specific things that made you a trader. So that's sort of who I was the bridge to. And I came into um, crypto with this belief that, you know, when somebody explained what an ICO was to me, I was like, oh, so it's like an IPO, except unlike an IPO, where the only people who can actually benefit from a big move in the stock price on the first or second day are people who are clients of Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, all the people who are sort of on the inside of money, is separate even, not, not even accredited investors, just literally people who like keep their money at the right place. An IPO happens and it's hot, it's Uber. Uber says to JP Morgan, okay, we're giving you exclusively like this met, this percentage of our shares, which JP Morgan in turn would then go to their high net worths and say, hey, you're in on Uber and we're going to be able to flip this and double your money, whatever. So it was like rich people getting richer. And here comes mm. these ICOs hitting me up with Initial this Initial coin offering. Thank you. Is not sure. Yes. Here come these, these ICOs saying... We want everyone to be able to participate in those kind of moves after like the initial, that initial moment to 2x, 3x, 5x, 10x your money. And it seemed on a level to me of, of having not done a deep analysis, just like on a surface level and as like a lefty politically anyway, it was like, I love that. I want people around the world to be able to participate in these sort of financial success moments and not be kept out of the system because they can't afford it or they don't know the right people or whatever. So that, you know, that's what really brought me in. And, and for anybody who remembers crypto in 2017, 2018, the ICO was everything, right? It was just like, that's, I, you know, I created, um, 
business plans, white papers, tons of videos, explainer videos, um, and product videos, uh, which is something that my company did, especially animation, a lot of data visualization, a lot of strategy. And, and even there was a company at the time for whom I did some work called DNA and DNA were trying to be the clearinghouse for all ICOs and all crypto around the world. And they had this guy, Brock Pierce involved, this guy, Scott Walker, um, that's where I started. I didn't really realize how involved Brock Pierce was in DNA, that he'd been one of the co-founders, because he was sort of the um, the key that led me to realize that crypto was just completely rife with scammers, scum, villains, criminals, and people who had previous experience in stealing people's money. But I didn't know that initially. Uh, Unfortunately, the main company for whom I did the most work and got paid the most in, to be clear, cash. I never took a coin from anybody, not a single one. But um, I did get paid by this company called BCT. And BCT was blockchain terminal was building like a Bloomberg terminal for crypto, which seemed like a perfectly reasonable idea. And they had like hardware. They were buying Samsung 27-inch curved screens and paying software developers. Their CEO was a very legitimate guy named Bob Bonomo who came from New York finance world from Alliance Bernstein. It all seemed very real to me. Um, subsequently, I would find out with my friend Gabriel Ortiz, who was working with them as well, that the whole thing was a scam. And we exposed the scam and we actually brought it to everybody, every three letter agency in the US we could find. Because when I found out that the person who ran BCT was a, not a guy named Sean McDonald, as he had claimed, but a guy named Boaz Manor, who was a convicted criminal in Canada, and that he was surrounded by these other people who were all criminals, I, they were in my offices. They had rented office space for me. So I kicked them out of my offices, and they left their hard drives behind. So I had the hard drives with all the proof that they were criminals. And... So I took it to, you know, like I said, every agency I could think of. And just this week, actually, Edith Pardo, who was with Boaz Menor, the main sort of uh, perpetrator of the scam, but who was pitched to me as the money behind BCT before the ICO, she just got, I think she just got 40 years in jail. Um, she's 70, so she's spending the rest of her life in jail, basically. Um, Boaz Menor is on the run. Nobody knows where he's currently residing. I'm pretty sure he's in his dad's basement in Toronto. Um, cause his dad also seems like a criminal. I, I have to say, like, they just seem like bad people across the board, but along the way, one of the things that this sort of did, uh, we, one of the things we were tasked with, the other thing that was happening in 2017, 2018, very apropos of what you're doing was there were all these, um, conventions, events happening all over the world, Dubai, South, you know, Seoul, South Korea, Singapore, Australia. And we were sending teams to all of them to promote BCT. So I was spending BCT's money essentially on marketing them through these events. And because of that, um, we got to know people at the absolute top, the apex of the crypto industry, everybody who's a major name that you've heard of. And I will say to a, without exception, Every time I dug into who these people were, I was like, oh, this person like did a Ponzi 10 years ago. This person ran like a fucking murder for hire scheme. This person has been credibly accused of being a pedophile. Like it just kept. And finally, my friend Gabriel and I were like, Gabriel had brought in a billionaire who will remain nameless for the purposes of this, but to invest in BCT. And this billionaire had said, can you like do some deeper vetting for me? And when Gabriel started doing it and started pulling me into it, we just could not believe what we were finding. So this is 2018 into 2019. Then, you know, the players start to change because then you start to get some of the DeFi players and some of the, the um, whatever Alameda research, whatever you want to call it, because it's such bullshit. I hate to even give it a, a name, but whatever it is, those like weird agglomerations of money that are investing in crypto and are market making and doing all that stuff. And it was very easy for us to discern that all these people were straight up criminals too. 
it's not like, oh, Doquan actually seems like a great guy or Justin Sun is cool or like Sam Bankman Freed. Oh yeah, solid. No, none of these people were solid. And no offense to you, but if you came to me and said, Rob, I've got $400 million. I'm going to be market making on this exchange. It's going to be out of the Cayman Islands via Sealand, via Dubai. I'd be like, oh, without being a dick about it, what are your qualifications to do this? I'm really smart. It's like, okay, I'm really smart too, but I wouldn't be qualified to do that. So why are you... Sam Bankman-Fried, who's 26, Do Kwan, who's 25, Justin Sun, whatever you are. Why do you think you're qualified to do this incredibly complicated, difficult, and dangerous thing? Dangerous in the sense um, that, you know, there are regulators around the world who look really closely at this stuff, and, and they're slow, but they do eventually figure it out, usually. Like, it could take them a long time. Bernie Madoff got away with it for a long time, but he didn't get away with it forever. And, you know, the difference between Bernie Madoff's scheme and, and most of these crypto schemes was the existence now of social media and people being able to call you out in real time, right? So then I started looking at, at audits. Okay, couldn't find any. So I'm like, how can all this financial structuring, because, you know, I know from living in New York City and marketing, um, you know, marketing uh, for financial companies, the extreme levels of care that you have to take in what you say, how you say it, and where you say it. And here were all these crypto companies coming to me saying like, hey, so can you market us? We're a utility and blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, let me stop you right there. You're not a fucking utility. I know what a security is. I know what the Howey test is. And I know that you are a security. So no, I will not market your product as a utility because I don't want to go to jail. And they'd be like, what do you mean go to jail? I'd be like, because if you break these laws enough, you not only will get your money, you know, raked back, but you'll also end up in jail. Like you can't in the U.S. for all the flaws of the SEC and all the flaws of the CFTC and all the flaws that are there, they will get you if you keep pushing this bullshit. So I think of the crypto companies I worked with, I think f five or six were like, yeah, so I want this thing to be called a um, – you know, I want this thing to be called a utility or whatever. And I would be like, absolutely not. Here's why not. I would write them a whole memo, like explaining to them, like, I'm not a lawyer. You should talk to your lawyers, but you're not going to find a lawyer in New York City who's going to tell you you can call this a utility. And once it's actually classed as a security, good luck. Because securities laws are very specific and you are not capable of following them. Like the level of sophistication of risk management that you need to really follow securities laws in the U.S., you need a, a risk management department with very um, experienced people who, again, to be fair, my least favorite phrase that everybody of your age in the U.K. seems to say over and over, it's like a verbal tick. It's like how my generation said like all the time. <laughs> you guys always say to be fair. Having said that, to be <laughs> To be fair, risk management in the U.S. at like a, a Goldman Sachs or a smaller, you know, kind of bank is a shitty job where your colleagues hate you because you're always the one saying no and they ignore you and then they get in trouble. Right. It's not like risk management works perfectly now, but it exists. The risk management people at Terra, Luna, at, you know, Justin Sun's companies at, at um, Alameda were a joke. And they knew they were a joke. And you can read now all of, you know, these things they were saying in 2019 and 2020 when they were trying to say to their colleagues, like, oh, we should probably be careful about X, Y, or Z. And they were basically told to fuck off. Binance, the worst of all. Um, Wintermute. I mean, they're, these are, they're just all criminal conspiracies. They weren't real companies. And the people who ran them, who were venerated by the crypto community, some of whom are still venerated by the crypto community, these people are criminals who don't understand what they're doing, never understood the regulatory space they were in, never understood how to do it right, and never should have been given the keys to anything. Not a fucking car. I mean, these were not people claiming to me. I met a couple people who are, again, very senior in this, and they weren't smart enough. I was like, you know, if you meet the top, top people at Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, there are many loathsome things about those companies. There are many evil things that they do. But man, you meet those people at the top, you're like, yeah, you're fucking smart. 
Like you can see a gigantic picture. There was not a single person I met in crypto who had that kind of a brain for anything other than software. And no offense to software developers, because some of my best friends literally are software developers. And software developers are great. They are not, in general, generalists who can see the big picture, understand all the different pieces. They're like, I make product. The product I make is very difficult to make, requires a lot of focus. <laughs> it's not like, it, it's, it's a kind of intelligence. It's not the kind of intelligence that is right to be the CEO or CFO of a financial services company where you need a different kind of mind and a different kind of, of view, a bigger picture view in order to um, be successful. I'll say parenthetically that it's really interesting that I, uh, this is probably unfair of me to blame on crypto, but nonetheless, if you look at the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate and Signature Bank, and I played a part in Signature Bank's failure, which I'm very proud of, but they were sort of like playing a fuck it game that felt very like, oh, did you guys talk to some crypto CEOs over at your bank? Now, as it happened, Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate were both run by guys who were much dumber than the ordinary banker, like for various reasons, some of it involving religion and like, don't want to go too deeply into detail on that. But these were guys who were very like Christian God is on our side. And it's like, as soon as you hear that somebody running a bank, you're like, no, 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 no. You know, what's on your side math. I don't care what religion you are. You can be any religion you want. Never mention it to me. If you have my money, what I want you to tell me is your incredible strategy for hedging just in case a black swan event happens. And banks are supposed to do that. Crypto companies don't. They don't hedge. They never hedge. They're the opposite. They go all in on every goddamn bet. And then you give them leverage and they go all in times 100 on every bet. Much and that's like why many, many of yeah. their investors as well. <laughs> it's quite Indeed. Funny. It's complete. Well, because they're like, well, if I can 10x this, then why wouldn't I leverage my 10x? It's like, because what if it doesn't 10x, dude? And like, you know, Silicon Valley Bank made a massive and deeply insane bet on interest rates versus inflation. And it's, it's too boring to go into. You can read about it somewhere else, but the bet they made was not a bet that they made 60%. They weren't like, okay, we're going to take 60% of the bank's assets. Cause we really believe in this bet and 40% we're going to take a hedge just in case, you know, and yes, that affects our upside, but it protects our downside. And we're a bank and protecting your downside is what a bank is supposed to fucking do because it's holding human beings money for their mortgage, for their life, for their retirement. It's not like, woohoo, let's fucking take a shot, baby. That's not how you're supposed to run a bank. And what all of these banks did really is they were like, they just played the crypto game. They were just like, fuck it, leverage. Let's do this. This bet is never going to lose. And like the one thing that always happens is not the one thing that never happens. People say black swan. And I say, okay, so if you make a bet in 2007 that the entire US housing market is going to move up and then it moves down, that's not a black swan event. That's just what happens. That's just the way the world works. Sometimes things go up, sometimes they go down. They don't go down like people would say in 2007. Well, the housing market isn't going to go down in New York and Miami and Las Vegas and Orange County. It's like, yeah, that is exactly what happens. The whole market moves. And if your bet is not hedged against the whole market moving in one direction and the market moves in that direction, chaos, doom. Like in that case, they crashed, basically crashed the world economy being idiots. And in this case with crypto, luckily, we, I think, you know, I, I'll take a, the 0.001% credit for this. Other people did a lot more work than I did, but people did a decent job of warning enough regulators to keep crypto over there and not inextricably linked into the financial system because you can't give the keys to people like Sam Bankman Freed. I want to I be clear here. This is not to say that Sam Bankman Freed was the problem. Crypto is the problem. But Sam Bankman Freed is an inevitable result. G uh, Giovanni Devasini is an inevitable result of the existence of an unregulated or loosely regulated get rich quick scheme. Those guys are attracted to that shit. Crypto is like a fucking, you know, 
honey for bees mm. or bears, <laughs> something. I don't know. It's not important. <laughs> it's not important. The point is, of course, the worst people are going to be attracted to something where you're like, hey, I know you spent a little time in jail or I know that you got dinged for securities fraud for whatever. Giovanni De- Devasini's case, I think he got dinged for running a Ponzi scheme. In Quadriga's case, those guys had run Ponzi schemes in the past, right? The, they look at crypto and they go, fuck, yeah. Here's mm-hmm. a spot where I can just get in, do my bullshit. I'm good at lying. I'm good at marketing. This instrument, crypto, is created perfectly for people like us. And I will, like people who say in the crypto space, you know, we need to be regulated. We need to work with regulators are right. The problem that they face is that I don't think there are any regulations they're going to get that aren't going to just kill crypto. Mm. Like I don't see a path where crypto can exist in a fiat run marketplace because ultimately um, there's a great line that Paul Krugman, who's a preeminent sort of left wing um, economist in the U S who writes the New York times always says, which is the U S government is just, social security with an army. And like the important takeaway from that is the full faith and credit of fiat, the full faith and credit of the U S dollar, which is the world's reserve currency comes specifically from the fact that like you fuck around with the U S you find out, right? We Mm -hmm. have, we spend insane hundreds of billions of dollars a year on our military so that you can't fuck with us basically. And then if you're a person who wants to buy a barrel of oil, you're like, well, I better use the U.S. currency because it's the safest thing. Crypto comes in and says, we want to replace that. We want to be the reserve currency. We want to be the way you buy that barrel of oil. It's like, okay, you and what army? Because they have an army. The people you're saying you're going to take on. Forget for a second if crypto is good or bad. It doesn't matter in a way. Just think of it as other. Other comes along and there's the incumbent and the incumbent's like, I literally have fucking nuclear weapons. That's what backs my shit up. What backs your shit up? Um, There's this really cool algorithm. It's like, fuck off algorithm. That's not going to beat, that's not going to beat the existing system. So, okay, fine. The existing system is not going away much as crypto would love for it to. It's not going anywhere. Now what happens? Well, we still want to exist, even though we can't destroy fiat currency. We still, okay, so what does that look like? What regulation can be written that says both the Federal Reserve exists and there's this side economy that exists? And I think ultimately the answer is it just can't happen. Like, I don't think crypto can survive existing fiat countries' regulations, EU regulations, American regulations. And of course, you know, fascist dictatorships like China, which can just be like, no, like China doesn't have to explain anything to anyone. Right. Because it's run by mm. a cabal of horrible party apparatchiks who, if they don't like something, like when they decided they didn't like crypto, what did they do? They just were like, bye. Mm. Done. Like we wrote, it was a line in a Chinese communist party newspaper and crypto mm. had to go away. So I think, you know, if I were looking as a, as a true believer, it doesn't matter. If you're a true believer in crypto, everything I'm saying is immaterial to you because you do believe that it's going to overtake the world economy. But if you're not, if you're just like on the fence, you're like, should I invest in this? I would just say to you, like, do you really think in the next five years, crypto is going to get stronger when there is real regulation? Because I don't know, you'd have to describe what that regulation looks like to me and how crypto would be acceptable in this existing paradigm for me to think crypto is going to be anything other than like a novelty, like pet rocks in five years. Mm. Do you in your head have kind of any distinction between say crypto blockchain and Bitcoin or in your head? Cause I'm, are they all kind of synonymous together? Okay. I think, I think it's important actually to make these distinctions. I think Bitcoin is, um, not interesting to me as Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is interesting to me as an idea. And the, the underlying fundamental idea that, that Satoshi was pushing in, in his original paper is interesting and theoretically attractive. I think 
for me to get to somewhere where I think Bitcoin could actually become a useful thing for the world, you'd have to um, decouple it from libertarianism and Austrian economics and turn it into like really lean into the everyone in the world deserves to be a part of the economic system. And it's not fair that they're not. And this is a tool to fix that. This tool is not about like theories written by Frederick Hayek in 1948. It's about that. It's just like, what is the best way to make sure that if you're a farmer in Africa or, uh, you know, subsistence living in Australia or whatever, you have the same opportunity to trade in the global marketplace as anyone else. So you'd have to start from scratch, but like as an idea, I get that. And I like it. I think that there is possibility there. Blockchain is a technology. I'm not a technologist enough to speak strongly to. I know people smarter than me say that it's a bullshit technology that just has been around for 40 years and doesn't work. It's, it's intentionally inefficient for its inefficiency is interesting because the reason blockchain is inefficient is because instead of it being a centralized database where one entity can check it, it's a, a thousand databases that a thousand entities need to check every time you do any single thing on a blockchain, right? Again, theoretically, I get why that's interesting. Practically speaking, I don't think the way computing power works right now and the way timing works parenthetically, for example, when you do trading in New York City, the, the distance between you and the server that you're using makes a big difference because it's a micro, if you're off a microsecond on a high frequency trade, right, it hurts you. If your server is in New Jersey or your server is in Pennsylvania, the one in New Jersey is going to win because it's closer, physically closer. So blockchain is extremely inefficient in that it can't be like that. It can never be that fast because it's the way it's built is to not be that fast. Can it be useful? Probably. But again, I don't have the level of uh, of analysis to be able to say like why it would be useful or how that would help to have it be replicated multiple times across multiple jurisdictions. But maybe. And I do actually parentheses, parentheses, bracket parentheses. I do loathe the idea of national borders. And I think that like in a world of climate change and you know, all these problems that we have, like the idea that you're British and I'm American, like it's so dumb. Like mm. it's not helping anything. Like I don't like any of that. I don't like borders. I don't like nationalities. I don't like tribalism. And I think, again, theoretically, blockchain and to a lesser extent, Bitcoin can mitigate against nationalism, right? Because it can be like, it doesn't matter where you are. The blockchain is the blockchain wherever you are. It makes no difference if you're American or British. And like, that's good. I'm for that. Mm. But from a, just a pure, like, does the technology work to do the things that people tell me it's supposed to do? For instance, transactions. Absolutely not. Transactions cannot work on the blockchain because you can't, when you put your credit card into a machine, you need the answer to whether or not you are spending $3 or three pounds on your coffee now. You can't have a thousand machines in a thousand places checking to see if your transaction is appropriate and you have the $3 in your account. No, you need fucking Visa or whoever with their one server and their one point of, you know, success or failure, making it quick because we all want the convenience of that. You, I just don't think there's a world where people are going to be willing to wait five minutes to find out if they were right to pay three pounds for their coffee. What about the uh, Lightning Network? Do you follow that at all? Yeah, but the Lightning Network, it's, it's fake. Dude, don't don't waste your time. Just please, I promise you, I Lightning know, Network, Layer seems... 2, Layer 2 is just Visa, but worse. Like, there's already Layer 2. It's called Visa, and they're fucking great at it. And the Lightning Network is run by people who are not. Visa wouldn't hire those people to be their fucking butlers. I'm sorry, but, like, the great minds of technology in the world, like my very good friend... Uh, Mike Dubno, who was the chief information officer of Bank of America, wrote the risk analysis software for Goldman Sachs, is a genius, right? Like he's not working for Lightning Network. He laughs at Lightning Network. And I'm I'm putting words in his mouth. That's not fair. I mean, he does, but he'd have to say that himself. But it's not serious. Like the serious technology is the technology being used by Visa and MasterCard and um, you know, the European Union now has their digital trans, you know, transfer network. Those are serious technologies. 
and they are run with the highest level of security and they still fail. And I don't trust that the people at Lightning Network who have a vested interest in making money off of the Lightning Network are going to do anything but make money off of the Lightning Network. I never think they're going to build a technology that's robust enough or good enough. And, and again, as soon as you say layer two, I'm like, but there is layer two and it exists in the world and it's fine. Like it's not solving a necessary problem. If, if you look at El Salvador, you know, if you look at what Bukele has said about uh, remittances, right? So if, like I lived in Los Angeles for years. I had lots of friends from El Salvador. I played soccer on a team of El Salvadorans and worked with, with Salvadorans. Wonderful, amazing people. Their lives were very much like I make money and I send half of it, a third of it, all of it home so that my mom, dad, brother, sister can eat, right? It's, you know, like incredibly hardworking, difficult circumstances, amazing people, absolutely amazing people. It, using Western Union and Western Union charging them what it charges them, I understand the perspective that Bukele brought to that, which is like, can't there be a better way and a fairer way and a less expensive way to make this work. So there's a, a, like, this is like a perfect example in a way, because there's a problem. It's a legitimate problem that you and I and everyone else can agree is a problem, which is what is the cost of transferring money for a Salvadoran from America back to their home country? Because you want the most money possible to end up in the pockets of the people in El Salvador. That's the goal for, I think everybody shares that goal. Like it's the fairest thing. These people need money in order to survive and they should get as much of it as they can. And Western Union doesn't need to be charging eight, nine, 10%. It doesn't seem fair to me. Now, Western Union will argue with that and they'll say, no, actually our costs are whatever, but let's, let's say they're lying and that Western Union is taking too much, um, too much money out of people's pockets and putting too much into the pockets of their investors, their CEO, whatever. So real problem needs a real solution. Nothing that I've seen in how the remittance system, which, you know, was sort of a lightning knockoff because it was what a strike or whatever initially and nothing in it seems to actually be helping Salvadorans win that game. Like I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a thing in the U S called payday lending and it's the grossest thing. It's basically like, I don't have a bank account. I'm from Mexico or El Salvador. I live in the U S I work, I get my paycheck and I don't have a bank account. So what am I supposed to do with it? You go to a payday lending place and they're like, Oh, you get, you made $500. Here's 420 in cash. There you go. And it's like, wait, so you're charging 20% or 30%. It's fucking gross. I had a friend um, who is a famous movie director who again will remain nameless. He had a bunch of money being thrown at him by Silicon Valley, Sequoia and other people that he was already in business with. And he, he, they had, he's got very kind of lefty politics and they said to him, is there anything you want to do? And he said, yes, I want to, I want to take on payday lending. And the way I want to do it is I want to charge 10% instead of 30%. That's it. That's my whole business plan. And like, I'll cap my CEO's pay. And like, he had a whole, he had a whole model that he built. Like, if these technologies can create that kind of disruption, but the thing about that kind of disruption, the difference between that and lightning networks say, is that what this person was saying was no one in this value chain, this is not about anyone becoming a billionaire by creating this business. This is about creating a fairer small business that helps people. I never ever hear that from anyone in crypto. It's always like when you talk to the investors, you talk to the people running any of these businesses, it's always like, then our coin and then our thing, and it's going to be a multi-billion dollar business. It's like, why? You're trying to solve a problem often in the case of crypto of people with not a lot of money trying to move money around. And you're telling me you're supposed to get rich off of that because the only way you get rich off of that is by stealing that money from the pockets of poor people. And that to me is not an acceptable solution. And, and the analogy, which... I'm pretty happy about honestly because I've been work I worked this one for a while. It's like Lightning Network is like this, and and in a in a way, so is blockchain. It's like, hey, gas cars they're bad. Climate change, you know, the way gasoline gets gets refined, it's bad. We got to come up with a solution. We have an idea: coal-driven cars. 
It's like, wait, no, no, no. That's, I mean, I get it's different, but it's worse. You're not, I, you've identified the problem. You've come up with a solution. You, as it turns out, weirdly are a co own a coal mine who knew. And you're telling me that coal car, it's like, no, your solution to a problem has to be better than the existing incumbents. And you have to have a plan for how you're going to fight them and win. And that is the only way to create any of this stuff. So Lightning Network, it's incumbent on them to say, here's how we're going to beat Visa. Here's how we're going to beat MasterCard. We're going to beat them both in terms of our technology, in terms of ease of use for the consumer, saving money for the consumer. And along the way, we're not trying to get rich. We're trying to like solve a problem, which maybe will end up with us getting rich. Who knows? But what I do know is it's going to make the world a better place. I believe in that. Like, show me that, and I fucking I'll be the first one to sign up and or market for them. But it's just like every time I talk to someone in crypto, I'm just like, you're just talking about your bags, man. And I don't give a fuck. Like Sam Bankman Freed, again, I don't want to harp on him too much because people are trying to do this thing where like, oh, crypto's great, but Sam Bankman Freed was bad. No. Sam Bankman Freed, if you looked at that guy and you were like, how can all the people at his company be making this much money? There's not that much extra in any business model. There just isn't. There's not like, look, we're so good at what we do that everyone who's a VP or above can make $500,000 a year. It's like, fuck off. No, you can't. Your business is not that good. Like that just means that you're stealing the money from somewhere. Could be from your customers legally, or it could be illegally, but either way you suck. And I don't like you and I will fight you because you're a gross human being. Even, you know, Elon Musk, who legitimately has built up incredible businesses and has done all these things. The fact that he's that rich tells me he's gross. Like, because that's too much money to have taken out of a system that is too expensive for a lot of people. I'm like, you know what? Like Jeff Bezos. It's like, dude, if you were worth 60 billion instead of 120 billion and everybody who worked in Amazon got paid 50% more, that sounds like a better world. And that makes me think you are not a scumbag. But unfortunately, I just made that up because that's not what you did. You just decided to maximize everything for yourself. Fuck everyone else. Fuck your workers. You don't care. As long as you got your 120 billion, they can all make $15 an hour instead of 20. And like, I can't with that. And that ultimately se separate out the technology questions. Again, not, not an expert. The people who have chosen to come into the crypto world and have chosen to try to make themselves so much money, that is gross. They are the problem. And as many of them can end up in jail as possible makes me happy. If we get this entire group, if Mike Novogratz, the Winklevoss twins, Justin Sun, Do Kwan, Sam Bankman Freed, on and on, on, I want all of them in jail. They all deserve to be in jail. They're all clearly criminals. And then maybe after we get that done, maybe there's a crypto spring because good people get involved. People who genuinely believe what they're saying. And they're like, oh, actually, all the, good, all the good people are still left. All the few good people are still left. I don't think there are. I don't believe there are any right now. I think there has really? to be like, I think this is Pol Pot. Like if, um, I don't know if that reference will be useful for you, but in, you know, in the 1970s. No. <laughs> so the 1970s in Cambodia, this guy, Pol Pot, um, came into power and his whole thing was a thing called year zero. He basically said anyone with a high school education or above has to be removed from society. What he actually meant was we're going to line them up against the wall and shoot them. So he did that. He, they killed, I don't know, one and a half million people in, in two years, just lining them up against the wall and shooting them. Anybody who had an education, because his whole theory was like, now we can re-educate everybody the right way. And he, he had some weird, it was like a weird communist fascist thing. But like, I think that's what crypto needs, minus the killing. I, I do think like crypto needs, like we just have to wipe out everybody who came in in the first, the first round because everybody was just so focused on getting rich that they lost all their ethical and moral grounding and created all these, these paradigms, products, net, interconnected networks that were just inevitably going to be criminal because money. Because money, money, money. Everybody just fucking wants money. Uh, I'm not, I live a perfectly decent life and I, you know, I'm 
something of a hypocrite here. I'm not like living barefoot in, you know, on the streets. I do live a nice life. Seems fine to me how I live. I don't really feel like I need much more than what I have in order to be happy. And, and I think that's, you know, the driving, especially for somebody your age to think about like, what, what is your goal in all of this stuff? And like, you deserve to be able to buy your own house, raise your own family, drive a nice car, go on vacations, do all that stuff. Like you deserve all of that. And your generation has really gotten the short end of the stick on, uh, I think a lot of like housing expenses and all, I don't have to list it for you because you're living it. So, you know, I don't think any of that's fair. And I do hope that, you know, people your age can like figure out a way to, to live good, healthy, happy, you know, lives of abundance, but nobody needs to be a billionaire. Like there just shouldn't be any. So now I'm switching it away from like, my problem with crypto to my problem with everything. My problem with everything is that there are too few people who have too much and too many who suffer too much. And I, if crypto was solving that problem, I would be the first in line. I just don't believe that the people who are involved in crypto actually believe that they should be solving that problem. I think the problem they're worried about is whether or not they have a yacht. Mm. I want to kind of come back a little bit to kind of the layer two idea. Cause I know you said, you don't need layer two on Bitcoin because you have Visa. But the settlement layer of, say, Visa, so kind of going back to Fedwire and that kind of stuff, that's closed off to most people. And there's zero way. I know self-custody, you can have either opinion. But if you wanted to, say, actually self-custody your money digitally, there's no way to do that. And so I think there's a lot of people who talk about, like, with Bitcoin, you still want a visa like person on top of Bitcoin, even if it's centralized, because that's like your general, you're buying your coffee, you're making things easy, but you still have the option if you wanted to, to take it off and to actually self custody in those scenarios where you thought an entity was say doing bad stuff. And isn't there also the argument that like one lightning that although someone's building it, there's no one person who kind of runs it, owns it, I've used it, it works really well, you can buy a coffee. And it will only take you literally milliseconds and no fee. Um, and I know there's a lot of people hit on at the start because it's kind of clunky. But as there's more liquidity going into it and people are starting their own nodes, like it's starting to pick up a bit of steam. And it seems that with that, there is no token to market. There's no get rich quick scheme. It's actually it's quite hard to make money off the Lightning Network because the fees are so low. Um, so is there an argument that the kind of the companies who are doing more like the on the ground stuff like Let's try and make this wallet better. Let's see if we can make this faster without launching a token. Um, generally, the more unsexy companies is, and it seems that there are some people doing that. I mean, even say like, say Jack Dorsey from Twitter. I don't know if you follow Jack Mallers. I know like Lynn Alden, Jeff Booth, these kind of people who seem more grounded, um, who are just like, they're not on, they're not, they're not attracted to the shiny stuff, making money. They do actually want, they are, they're interested in it. They're not necessarily like, this is everything, but they want to try and improve it. Is there is there a risk of kind of blanketing those kind of people with everyone else? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, I'm painting with a broad brush because that's what I do. So, you know, grain of salt on all of this. Um, not everyone is the same. And I, I take it's let's start with the self-custody question, because I think it's a really interesting one. It's actually not true that you you can't currently self-custody. It's called keeping your cash under your bed, right? That's self-custody. Now let's compare to go back to my coal car versus gas car analogy. If I'm like a lot of people who keep cash in their houses, um, if you're, if you're a fan of like true crime shows, like my uh, fiance is, you notice certain things that pop up in all of these stories. One of them is farmers don't like banks because banks tend to hold liens on their property and whatever. And, you know, it can be very difficult for them. So they tend to keep their cash under their bed. And there's a lot of crimes that happen in rural America of like somebody robbing, you know, a farmer of the $30,000 that he's keeping under his bed. That is self-custody that is literally available to a, f a well, I don't want to, uh, you know, be, unfair to the intelligence people, but like a, a, an unsophisticated farmer can self custody their cash. When you talk to me about self custody of crypto, it's not easy. It's not, it, it involves exposing yourself 
to a level of potential um, difficulty vis-a-vis losing your money. Like, okay, how do you lose your money if you keep your cash under your bed? Somebody steals it, your house catches on fire, money's gone. How do you lose your money if you're self-custodying with a, you know, with a cold or a hot wallet? Well, somebody hacks you, there's a phishing scam, somebody, you keep it on like a drive and somebody comes with a hammer and says, I'm going to beat you up if you don't give me the drive and the passcode. And then you do, because obviously you don't want to die. It's harder and more complex and more confusing and involves more players. It's one of those things where like, one thing I can tell you about a bundle of cash is it's just a bundle of cash. I really don't need to explain to you what, you know, you should probably keep it in a fireproof safe. Other than that, I don't have much I have to tell you. You come to me and you're like, look, Rob, I've got this really cool new cold wallet. Okay, so here's all you have to do. You need a 12 word um, passcode. Obviously, you're going to want to write that down, but don't write that down anywhere near you. Okay, so that's the start. Now, when you transfer in and out, here are the things you have to watch out for. Like a- any of those wallets, after a while, because I did some product marketing for a couple of, of wallets in 2018, any of those wallets after a while, you're like, this sounds like there are a lot of failure points for what should be a really simple thing, which is me and my money. Now, in theory, in a bank, right? So we're com- now I'm comparing self-custody to self-custody, but now let's compare self-custody to like traditional finance. I have my money in an FDIC insured bank. I can take money out. I can pay for things with my phone. I can have my, my paycheck go right into my bank account. I mean, that sounds pretty great. That sounds really easy. Even an idiot can can use that. I don't want to be in the position where I am defending the behavior in general of banks. Banks do lots of terrible things. But if you're saying to me, hey, Rob, in general, lightning, hey, Rob, in general, self-custody, I'm going to tell you like, yeah, those things sort of exist already. And I'm not clear that what you're proposing to me is better than them. I understand it may be different. I understand that, it, you know, like what you were describing about being able to pay um, for your coffee with the Lightning Network. It's like uh, um, in a hermetically sealed world of crypto, you've just described to me a good way to use crypto. You haven't described to me in general a better way to pay for things because I just told you I can do everything you just said with my phone, with Visa from my bank account. I'm glad that you can do this quickly with the Lightning Network using your crypto, but now you're talking about crypto, which was worth $28,000 today and $20,000 tomorrow and whatever. And like, that ain't my fucking problem because I got my money in a bank and like, it's, I don't really have to think about like the price of my money. It, obviously, inflation is the wild card here because if inflation gets severe, then you do have to think about the value of your money. But in general, for most people, for most of their lives, they don't have to think about any of that shit. They don't have to check a fucking stock ticker to know that a dollar is a dollar. But if you have Bitcoin, whether you use Lightning Network to buy that, you're like, yesterday, I bought this coffee with 0.0000001 Bitcoin. Today, it's 0.00002 Bitcoin. That's not actually a good way to be a currency. Currency stability is what makes a currency work. You're talking about a layer on top of a thing that is the problem. Like, so let's say that lightning isn't the problem. Let's say the technology isn't the problem. Let's say the people who run it aren't the problem. Let's say that Jack Mallers actually is a good person. I have questions, but let's say he is. I don't think any of that is solving some problem in a way that is going to lead us to a better world as opposed to like with the remittances thing in El Salvador, I do see, a, and that is actually Jack Mallers to be fair. I, I do see a path there to a better world. I don't know that crypto is the right way to get there, but at least like I do kind of feel like everybody's heart is kind of in the right place who isn't just trying to make a buck. Right. Like it is the right uh, human response to say, I want those people to have an easier way to keep more of their money. But you being able to buy coffee in Cardiff or London with Lightning Network instead of Visa, I'm like, I don't really care. It's not you're not solving anyone's problem. You're not making anything better in the world. It's just another version of the same thing that actually has to uh, uh, imitate. Like everything you said to me about is like, I want to be able to buy a coffee with my phone quickly anywhere. It's like, right. Like I can do 
if crypto never existed. Well, I can do it too with crypto. It's like, oh, okay, that's cool. I mean, choice is great. I'm glad that you have that choice. It doesn't matter. You're not, nothing has been helped by you buying coffee with the Lightning Network. You just, it's just a different way of buying coffee. So, so like, I guess, again, not having enough, you know, real sophistication of the technology, understanding the technology to really make a deep analysis. I'll just say like, I don't think it matters. Like, I don't think you're, you're, you're not pitching something to me that I feel is necessary or useful. Now you said another thing about Fedwire and that is interesting because the U S in particular is behind a lot of other, um, like for me to send a, a wire transfer in the U S cost me 25 to $50. It takes two to three days. It's like ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And and when somebody in Bitcoin universe says, well, Rob, you could transfer this same money instantly, not pay 25 to 50 yellow with gas fees and whatever you're going to, but set that aside for a moment. Um, yeah, okay, cool. That Now you're telling me not that you can also buy coffee. You're saying, hey, Rob, you have a problem. I have a solution to your problem. I don't have a problem buying coffee at the fucking coffee shop with my phone. There's no problem there. You're not solving anything, but international transfers of money happening quickly or instantaneously for low fees. That sounds great. So I think what's going to happen, and I think this will be ultimately to crypto's credit, although I don't think it's going to help the crypto marketplace ultimately, but I, I will say like, you know, if when Uber came along in New York City, it if you were a person of color who wanted to get a get a car service in the Bronx, like cabs wouldn't pick you up, they wouldn't take you there. It sucked. It was ridiculous. Uber came along and forced the cabbies in New York to stop being racist assholes. So that's to Uber's credit. Like, good job. You made taxis better. I'm not sure I still need Uber, but because Uber causes all sorts of problems in our cities. Anybody who's seen the traffic can tell you why. But like, I'm glad you made cabbies start behaving better. If crypto can lead to me being able to transfer money internationally faster and cheaper, I will say thank you for doing that, crypto. I appreciate you. But I'm not going to use you because now I can just do this through my bank. And so, you know, that again is a thing. Like if you're if you're modeling a business. In, in the crypto space, and you have not analyzed that. You have not said, there used to be a thing like, I don't know, maybe when I was writing business plans with people like 10 years ago, the question I would ask everyone is, can Google or Facebook do this? Whatever you're pitching me? Because if the answer is yes, why aren't they just going to? And maybe your pitch is like, well, they'll buy me. I'm like, okay, fine. That's your exit strategy. Okay. But you have to tell me how you're protected from these gigantic incumbents already just figuring out how to do the thing that you're proposing to do and doing it with their 27,000 engineers to year two. The Fed has plenty of technologists. The Fed has plenty of money to spend on this. If the Fed wants to make it easier for me to transfer money internationally, they will eventually get around to doing it and it, they will make it cheaper and it will be fine. And then whoever has built that for crypto will go out of business because they're going to be competing against the 99% of people who use the thing they already know how to use. They're not, most businesses are not like super excited about new technologies. They're super excited about technologies that work and they don't care. And if the lightning network goes to a business and says, we're going to try this new thing, they're like, whoa, but if lightning network goes to people and says, Hey, you know how you pay 10% on every transaction with us, you pay five, you know what happens? Fucking door opens. And by the way, here's proof. We've done it 10,000 times. Here's why. Like that's a business. So maybe Lightning Network will get there. Maybe they will become cheaper than the incumbents, work better, all of that, and then they'll succeed. But also maybe like Visa will be like, actually, we have a settlement solution. We have 400 engineers who just threw it together in six months. And, you know, mono again, I will say, not here to defend monopolies. Monopolies are bad. But when it comes to money, it's interesting. It's like, it's the one place where I'm like, I don't want there to be more than the dollar in the US. I don't like having to change my money when I go to England. Like, I just want one money. 
I don't want to think about it. I don't want to have to think about custody. I don't want to have to think about value. I don't, I don't want to think about it. I got enough to think about, man. I don't want to think about my money. I just want to make it, store it, use it. Make it, store it, use it. Make it, store it, mm. use it. That's all I want to do. And everybody in crypto is always telling me like, look, all you have to do is this, 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 and this. And then and I'm like, you lost me already. I think one I thing that... Again. One thing that kind of excites me is that I agree with all that. And certainly in the day to day, a lot of these things which are kind of said to be problems are really not problems. But I guess I almost kind of see it in that our ecosystem is like this building. And I kind of see Bitcoin as someone's just kind of gone and built like another fire exit. Like there's no need to use it. Absolutely no use. I'm going to use the regular door for now. But in the instance of a black sun or a fire, then I know there's that fire exit there. I mean, say, for example, like in the scenario of your yeah, That's cash. great. I love that analogy. That analogy is awesome. Mm, thank you. In the, in the scenario of, say, like cash under your bed, where you've got two kind of, I guess, fires. Well, one, heading if you head into a cashless society. Two, if you kind of, if you're traveling across borders, you're probably not going to carry 100 grand in cash with you. Or if you do, you're going to have to take a lot of trips and it's going to be really hard. Aside from, say, just remembering a 12-word key phrase. And then three, if you left that pile of cash under your bed for, say, 100 years, well, 100 quid would probably be worth one quid. Um, and obviously, there's no guarantee with something, say, like Bitcoin, but it's similar in, say, like keeping gold under your bed because, you know, someone's not going to print a lot of that gold. So in 100 years, that gold, yeah, there will be more of it, but you still own a fair share of all the gold in the world. And so say, like, in the event of if you have a very bad fire, there's obviously different varying scales of a fire but to go to the more extreme fire why my germany in that scenario one cash is now essentially useless right the currency in which you generally trade in the ecosystem is all of a sudden useless because what what would what what, what you could buy a bread with say one note the next day you have to have a wheelbarrow kind of thing and so in that scenario i can see if you had a digital means of just sending value to each other. It doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin or whatever, but a digital means of sending value, which no one could control, and the supply wasn't being inflated, all of a sudden, in my head, that would seem crazy valuable because society could kind of go on to an extent. You could still trade, you could still buy things, but the currency you're trading in is no longer being inflated like crazy, and you don't have to go and make a load of gold coins. It all exists there, and it's super divisible. So it almost seems like it's a nice insurance because we like there's one thing we know about a fiat system is that it never lasts. Every single fiat system has at some point crashed um, or gone down in certain flames. I mean, there's hundreds of examples because with incentives, if you can print, you will print kind of thing. And so at some point, the game the game ends. Now, that could be 100 years. It could be more. You could kick the can down the road. There's a lot of different scenarios. But it certainly seems that especially now, say we're coming to the end of 100 years of, you could say, this debt cycle, as Ray Dalio likes to talk about, that there are certain scenarios in that case where you could see pretty bad inflation. You could see kind of extreme currency devaluation. And in that scenario, it doesn't seem like there's too many options in which you could quickly switch your money into a digital, another digital means um, that would then protect you. And so that kind of that excites me a bit in terms of having that having that door there and having that optionality i get all that and i also think you know uh there's a generational thing here too that if i'm sitting in your shoes at your age i i want the idea of something new and different because the existing system i don't think has been fair to your generation and your generation hasn't even like come to grips with how unfair it's been I might apply the unfairness in a slightly different way, but I totally understand anybody in your age range being like, there's got to be some other way to deal with this problem because I'm just being handed a shit sandwich. Um, I think the most interesting place that that is occurring, which I don't think crypto is particularly useful around, is not in fact like transactional, but is around the value of stuff that people own, particularly houses, right? I think the way your generation is most fucked is people my age and older are like, hey, bought a house for a hundred thousand pounds. It's worth a million pounds now. 
I did it. Cool. We need to build some more flats in our town center for younger people because they can't afford. To- no, you can't build anything near my house because that would hurt my uh, property value. Oh, okay. Well, where are these younger people going to live? I don't know. They can fucking six of them can live in a shitty apartment in London. I don't care. Not my problem. My property value is awesome because that's my generational wealth that I, I worked for. It's like, did you though? Or did you just buy something cheap that then accrued in value at the expense of everybody else? Because not building housing, which is the problem of most Western economies is like, you didn't do that. You just made sure there were zoning laws that fucked other people so that you would keep yours. That to me, from a generational perspective, I look at that and I'm like, it is so unfair. Like if you go to San Francisco right now and you want to work in, you know, a, a cool startup, you're like, yeah, I just need to find an apartment. It's like, well, good luck. I hope you can afford $3,500 a month for a fucking tiny studio because San Francisco people live in San Francisco from the last generation chose not to build any new housing because they thought it would hurt their property values. So yeah, good luck. Let me know how that goes. Let me know how you're, let, let me know about living 90 miles outside of San Francisco and having to commute in every day for your job. Sounds great. Sounds super fun. Go live in Brighton and work in London, right? It's like all of this stuff is a generational problem. I do think that if I was sitting where you were sitting at your age right now, with half a brain, I might have a different perspective on crypto. I accept that. And I accept that it's not unreasonable for your generation to be like, there's got to be some other way to do this. My concern is that if I, if I say I'm going to give you all of the arguments that you're making about its value and just accept it, I still think the people who are at the top of the crypto game are the same shitty people making the same money. And until that changes, until there is no such thing as a Mike Novogratz in crypto, because there can't be, because the whole system is built so that, because like a new system is being built that just replicates the problems of the old system. I'm like, yeah, banks are bad because, you know, they accumulate so much wealth for their shareholders and they don't distribute enough of it in the form of, of, you know, uh, interest rates and savings. Uh, Okay. What's it like now? Well, 90% of crypto is controlled by these shitheads who make so much money. It's like, okay, that sounds like the same shit, man. And it's not going to help your generation. That's not going to solve your problem. So again, I'm not saying I'm right about that and that you're wrong because I, I, I I hear everything you're saying and I think it's very well argued and and thought through. Uh, And I accept that I could be wrong about a lot of this, but I am most concerned that, you know, people in your generation identify the problems that you're facing and come up with solutions that make sense in the context of the world that is coming. There is a 800 pound soon to be extinct polar bear in the room of this, of course, which is any energy, any fossil fuel that is burned, every kilojoule of fossil fuel that is burned is your death. Right. And like, Obviously, everything burns kilojoules of fossil fuel right now. So we're just murdering in like every generation to come, possibly to the point of an extinction level event for our species. So, you know, I'm very sensitive to the crypto environment argument. Very. Because it's just all bad. Like anything, I'm, I'm sensitive to like everyone who buys an SUV, in my opinion, right now is a criminal. Like it's criminal behavior. We can't do this anymore. We can't keep burning fossil fuels. The world is going to overheat. It's already overheating. So if I'm sitting in your shoes, I just, I was at a a dinner last night with a bunch of like 16 to 22 year olds who are the the sons and daughters of friends of mine. We were having this conversation. It's like, you know, if I were your age, I'd be really angry at older people about that. I'd be like, wait, you have... You, you bought a second home and you drive to it in a Range Rover, like in 2023, when we knew, I mean, we knew in 25 years ago, 30 years ago, Exxon knew in the 1970s, apparently that climate change was going to like come for us all. But I would be angry about that. And I'd be looking for solutions that fit into the paradigm of the electrification of everything, the move completely to renewables, the decarbonization of our, of our um, economics and environment. And I sort of wouldn't think anything else mattered because like 
all the things I said I want you to have in this life, you aren't going to get to have if we're two degrees hotter on this planet. You know, and we're we're blowing through every I mean, the latest IPCC paper is like it's pretty insane. Like if the Arctic if the Antarctic ice shelf falls, which it looks like it's going to, that's 10 feet of water. It's not going to be London. The Thames comes up 10 feet. You don't live in London anymore. Like the, the scale of the problems that your generation is facing are so massive. And like, you know, crypto, if it were not, if it, if the happenstance of the development of crypto, if Satoshi's solution to the problem had not involved his version of decentralization, but another one. And I'm talking about proof of stake versus proof of work, because I think proof of stake is dumb too, but it's better environmentally. But if, I don't know, I'm not a, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a computer engineer. If there had been some other solution which didn't exacerbate this existing problem, that would have been nice because it's just Satoshi's choice of, of you know, hash problem solving was a choice. It was not a necessity. I'm sure that you could redevelop crypto without it. And I know some people have tried. I mean, some of the solutions are dumber than the pro like Chia or whatever. That's like, a, it creates another problem. Like, let's just burn a bunch of hard drives. No, like we are, we came from a time of seeming total abundance. That's what my generation did. We burned everything. We built everything that we wanted for ourselves. And now we're leaving you with the results. And I, if, if I were sitting in your shoes, the thing that I would be doing and the thing I try to do in my my career as well, but you know, again, I'm a hypocrite, whatever, is come up with solutions to that problem. Like it, if there, I've met crypto people who are involved in all sorts of renewable energy stuff. I know there are people who are like-minded in this, in the crypto space, but just, you know, just since you made an, a generational argument to me, I think whether you meant to or not, I think you did. And I think that's reasonable. And I, again, if I was in your shoes, I might be making the exact same argument. I think you have to think about all the pieces of that. And how like your generation is not only going to create a stable fire escape for itself, but is also going to prevent fires from burning, maybe to extend your analogy mm. a little further. Uh, I mean, and I'm not sure. I worry that crypto is more fuel for the fire. So I've got a few interesting thoughts on this. I want to kind of forget about crypto and Bitcoin, kind of just get to basics. I guess with kind of energy um and then some of the kind of the more polluting gases so like in general with an electricity grid one of the biggest problems is not necessarily making the energy it's one transportation but two it's a supply demand mismatch so you have this with fossil fuels um but you can to an extent control it because you know when demand's going to increase you know when demand's going to drop off and you can actually control the supply brilliant but there are still cases where you will have waste energy. You can't fill all the gaps. So there is, there is still a lot of fossil fuel energy being burnt, but they're not actually going anywhere. Then we shift to kind of renewables. And so actually in that case, it'd be quite useful if there was a body who could switch on and off whenever you wanted to and pay you for using that energy, which no one's using. And hopefully it goes to kind of some larger good cause, whatever that may be. Then if we kind of go to renewables a little bit, the problem gets even worse. Um, so what was, what, was a, what was a pretty big problem before is now a huge problem because the supply demand mismatch is even larger because you, not only can you not control when people need the energy, you now can't even control how much energy you produce. You're at whim to the sun, you're at whim to the wind. Tidal is a little bit better, but you still can't control it. You can just predict it. And so all of a sudden, the kind of the chaos between how much energy is actually being supplied and how much energy is required has been extremely exacerbated. Now, the obvious solution is obviously batteries. But batteries have a major downfall in that, one, they're bloody expensive to make. Two, they are not so efficient. You can't store energy in them for too long. And three, you still have the problem of do you build a huge battery so that when all of a sudden there's not there's no need for energy, but you have loads of energy coming through, do you let the whole grid blow out? Or do you fill up this battery? Oh, no, shit, the battery's, battery's full now. We needed a bigger battery. But then the, the battery, the capacity is going to be used a certain amount of time. So once again, 
in this scenario, it seems like it'd be really useful is if there was an entity that would take your energy whenever you want it to. So it'd be like, give them a call like, hey, shit, man, we've got loads of energy. Can you take some of it all? And then they pay you for it. And once again, hopefully that energy goes to a better, larger cause. Both of those scenarios, it'd be super useful to have an entity that could do that. Now, generally, there's no one who can. The closest we have to it, uh, general servers um, and data centers, but or say like aluminium, aluminium kind of ores and these facilities, they will kind of work throughout the night to kind of try and balance this out. But the problem with data servers, you can't switch them on and on because they might be controlling the traffic to New York City, for example. You can't just switch that off. Oh, sorry, we need the energy and can you switch off later? So there's a massive gap in the market for a product that can switch on and off whenever you want and pay you for the energy. Then the kind of the major problem with climate change and what the kind of UN has said would be the most effective way of fighting climate change is getting methane down. Because methane is obviously it's like 80 times more polluting um, than carbon dioxide. And kind of the main places where methane, well, some of the main places where methane is given off is one at these kind of these oil sites, oil fracking sites, where you get a lot of vented methane. Now, generally, the kind of the only solution at the moment is to sort of burn it off. It's not fully efficient. And sometimes you don't even burn it off. It's just released into the air. And the reason why it's not captured, distributed, sent out in an efficient manner is because it's one, too costly. Two, you sometimes need a lot of regulation to kind of get all that set up. And three, it's kind of it's on and off. It's like you might have a bit of methane, but you don't have enough to like set up a load of pipeline and actually start shipping it off. Other areas where you get a lot of methane are kind of just general waste sites where you've got all this kind of stuff slowly biodegrading and you've got tons and tons of methane being given off. And so you kind of think, well, if it's such a big problem, why don't we just kind of, why don't we burn it and, and turn it into carbon dioxide? Because that'd be much better for the environment. But we don't because it doesn't really matter whether you need to do something. Humans kind of generally more do it because they want to. And one of the biggest drivers of want is money. And so to kind of go to all the effort to start burning off this methane compared to a competitor, say, wasteful site, you're going to be losing out on profit. And they might even overtake you. You might go bankrupt because you're so busy trying to burn your methane for no value whatsoever. And so once again, in this scenario, it'd be super useful if there was a portable machine that you could say have on site or you could say take to the old site. You could plug it up, you could capture the methane, burn it to 100% efficiency. So the only thing released is CO2 and you get paid for it because if they were paid for it, then people might actually buy these machines and stick them on their landfill site because they know they can make some extra money. And so it seems like all of this adds up to this need for a product that would burn your energy, hopefully for a better cause and would pay you for it because you could cut down all your methane stuff, energy which is being wasted anyway. So you wouldn't even need to make that much of a profit. It'd have to be just a tiny profit and that would be enough because at the moment you're making nothing from it and it's a huge problem to the environment. So now let's bring in the kind of the, the gorilla who is so hated in the world, Bitcoin mining. So Bitcoin mining uses X energy. Bitcoin mining is kind of this coal power station has been turned back on to mine Bitcoin. You see a lot of the bad stuff. But what's happening at the moment and what is actually happening is these Bitcoin miners are being shipped out to farms because you can carry it in a container, right? They're being shipped out to these wasteful sites. They're capturing the methane and they're burning it and then they're turning it into carbon dioxide. The same with these oil sites. Big oil companies are now partnering, not because they need to, but because they want to, because they can make money <clears throat> for good or bad reasons. But it means that that methane is now being, will, will and some of it is now being combusted to 100% efficiency to turn into carbon dioxide. Now, then the counter argument is, okay, maybe they're doing that, but there's still people who are gonna burn fossil fuels to mine Bitcoin, right? Okay, so it's, okay, maybe some people are gonna use it for good. They're gonna connect it to their solar panel farm, which is also happening. People are using like a combination of solar battery and Bitcoin mining to basically produce renewable energy more efficiently so it's cheaper for the end user. But you could still say, OK, it doesn't matter. Someone's going to start up a coal station or someone's going to stick it in to some power station and they're going to use that. Maybe in the short term, but in the long term, because of the mechanism of Bitcoin mining, there is only so much money that can be made from Bitcoin every single day. So in general, if I try to start a Bitcoin miner now in my office right now and plug it into mains, I would be losing money because it would cost me more money to actually run than I would be getting in return. And so if 
you are competing as a Bitcoin miner against someone who is using waste energy. So they only need to make a tiny profit because the methane is already being wasted. It's, just being, it's basically being burned anyway. So you only need to make, say, 10 quid an hour, if we'd be really extreme, to be profitable versus a Bitcoin miner who is trying to plug up to a fossil fuel plant which energy isn't being wasted. It's going to be, it's, no, it's not waste energy, it's useful energy. So they're going to have to charge more. Over, say, five years, that Bitcoin miner is going to be bankrupt. And the only miners that are left, especially every four years, given that there's a halving, it means that it's harder and harder to mine Bitcoin. It's less and less profitable. I can't do it on a computer here anymore. I need to be rigged up for the cheapest energy. And the only cheapest energy out there is this waste energy. So it kind of seems that everything is set up for the only mining that will eventually occur will be for waste energy because it won't be profitable. And there's so little Bitcoin already there. that It's like a smoothie. If we take this fuel, there's only the, the, this, there's this much at the moment. And in four years, is there going to be this much? The only people who are going to get that smoothie and remain profitable are the ones using completely waste energy. And so it almost seems like there are papers now and there are super smart people I've been following who were in complete, really strong environmental activists, leftists, whatever. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa we might have got this a little bit wrong because all of a sudden we can actually use this stuff and we can use it to reduce methane emissions. So there's a guy in Ireland who does this. He, he's going around to farm sites and he's basically been like, hey, if I stick this here, I'll capture your methane emissions, burn it into CO2 and you can actually get paid for it. And then the larger cause, which would be like the cherry on top. Well, if it was actually helping secure a decentralized money, which anyone in the world can just plug into and send value to each other, or say escape from one country to another, or let's say the, the truckers in Canada, all of a sudden bank accounts close down, they're completely closed out of the system because the only way to kind of exist in this system is to have access to online banking. Well, all of a sudden they got fuckloads of donations in Bitcoin because no one can kind of stop that. So if that was a larger cause you're contributing to, then that would also seem pretty good. Um, so that's kind of how I see the whole Bitcoin environment and the mining scenario. And it does feel like for me, the more I look into it, the more kind of makes it, the more it makes sense. And yeah, so that, yeah, I mean, that's kind of my main thoughts yeah, on that. Listen, that's all, it's very compelling. I don't, you know, I don't have enough information to um, say anything other than it sounds really compelling. I don't know. Uh, you know, Bitcoin miners became a certain kind of entity as a cash grab because mm. they could get public money, right? So Riot and others who became... And they didn't people. hedge either. No, they did not. <laughs> also, they made bets on like the Texas legislature, which is just the dumbest group of bucks <laughs> imaginable on this planet. So like they get what they deserve there. Um, yeah, I mean, look, that all sounds that all sounds really interesting. I get it. I don't, I don't really have any useful counter argument to any of that, but um, it's good at least you're thinking about it. I appreciate that. All right, mm. actually... Um, uh, Tatsuki, I uh, apologize, but I do have to go. That's right. We've been um, we've actually been here for quite a while. <laughs> None of this brings us any closer to um, the conference, I suppose. No. Well, actually, on that, we've had um, we've had to delay it. We've had to delay it for now. Um, I don't know if you're in the email list, but yeah, we've we j basically. I think yeah, I think I saw something actually. Um, but did you give a date or not? Yeah. So the date is now next year. Um, we thought we'd okay. push it by a year and then in the meantime, kind of just focus on, we'll do what I'm doing here now. Um, just kind of talking, having the podcast, building the audience. And there's even talk of maybe trying to broaden it a little bit, um, to kind of, I guess, in a sense, be less biased to a degree and try and include, whilst we wanted to kind of include different opinions like yourself and your kind of friends, but kind of broaden it to more just general things around the future. Um, cause I mean, like. I think we can all agree that AI is doing some pretty crazy things right now. And that's the kind of space that we'd like to pay some attention to as well. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I said this to the guys at Protos when I worked with them, you know, I think it is, I don't know that it's necessary to limit analysis of these sort of new technologies to crypto. Mm. It seems like, like you said, AI, full self-driving, whole bunch of other things where I think there's too much hype and not enough reality mm. um, are all worth covering. And also legacy systems and legacy systems interactions with these new things is mm. fascinating as well. 
How is the banking system going to deal with AI? How is the banking system dealing with crypto? How is Mastercard, traditional for instance. Markets? Yeah, PayPal with the yeah. Bitcoin. How are they viewing it? All this kind of and stuff. And then you're broadening then you're broadening the conversation in a really big way, and you can bring in a lot of different kind of experts and, and thinkers, and I think have more interesting uh, and deeper and longer lasting. Because let's say crypto falls apart, it could it could also take over the world. But if it does, and all you've been doing is talking about and covering crypto, then you're like, well, okay, that was a good run. Mm. As opposed to like, no, we think about bigger picture things of which crypto is one. Mm. And therefore, we have the uh, authority to speak on any number of, of topics in a way that our listeners will find compelling. Mm. You know, like that to me is just, it's a better, it's a better business model. That's, and even the other thing I've thought about as well is, so that's the scenario in which crypto for whatever reason doesn't do well but in the scenario it does do well takes over 100 percent adoption you're stuck in the timeline of yeah we're here to talk about the future but if the if if the future did arrive then what are you going to kind of talk about then it's like if all you did was speak about banking and then sort of banking happened you don't probably want to keep talking about banking you want to talk about the next thing because as you say people right. love the new stuff so it almost it frees you from that timeline um, for sure it's uh, the dog catching the car. <laughs> like, now what? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Give yeah. it back and I'll throw it again. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I do have to go, but uh, thank you for this conversation. It was awesome. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be back in London in uh, end of April, beginning of May. Stephen Deal and I have been talking about some, some business stuff as well. But, you know, if you wanted to, like, involve him in – podcast or whatever that would be yeah really awesome that would be amazing i'll connect you guys okay thank you so much yeah it's been a absolute pleasure talking to you again i still i love the story of our relationship and how it started from yes. a linkedin spat to a brilliant conversation and now to a finally yeah. a podcast episode and maybe i'll i'll leave it on this which is you know if you can engage with people with deep understanding of your point of view but also with respect and get the same back, you can have productive conversations. Mm. It, it, it requires two human beings who believe whatever they believe, speaking respectfully to each other in order to actually affect real, positive, useful conversation. Doesn't mean mm. people have to agree at the end. That's not the point. People are allowed to have differing points of view. But I think the struggle so many people have is figuring out how to speak respectfully and like it's one of the biggest problems of the modern world right now and social mm. media in particular. So yeah, I agree. It's nice. It's always nice for me when I can have a dialogue with somebody where it didn't start with like, yeah, we're a hundred percent on board. Like <laughs> that's great. And I, I hope, you know, I hope if nothing else, I can uh, continue to have those kind of conversations with people in this space and others. Mm. No, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And as you say, I feel like talking to someone with a different view who likes to listen, likes to talk about the views completely openly as well. Um, yeah, it's it's really it's refreshing, it's amazing, and um, it's been yeah, it's been an absolute treat talking to you today, Robert. Right on, Roberto. Right, man. <laughs> Roberto, have a have a great day, man, and we'll speak soon. Right on, Ted. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.